Hey guys, thanks for stopping in for some emergency survival tips. Today's video is on the top 15 items that are very overlooked for people who are preparing some sort of uh, emergency kit or just general preparedness things to have around the house in case of an emergency situation of any type. It doesn't matter if it's a random power outage, a weather event, or some kind of political unrest, or zombies, aliens. If it's an emergency, you may need these things, and a lot of people know the common ones like food, water, maybe a way to charge your cell phone, you know, the basic stuff is pretty obvious. But boy, do you not want to get left high and dry without these items. So in no particular order, and yes, it was a top 10 list until I thought of five more, we have got paper maps of the roads around your uh, local area as well as preferably your entire state. I don't know about where you live, but they are typically still sold at all of the gas stations around my area, and uh, they're pretty cheap too. Now you might be saying, oh, but I have my cell phone and I even have a solar panel with a battery bank that can charge it, so I'm all set. Well, that's great until you drop it, lose it, you're without it, you can't return to where it is, or it's underwater along with your computer. Remember, when it comes to any kind of survival items, one is none, and two is hopefully one. Also, you'd be surprised how many map apps claim that they have an offline component, but then really do need a data connection to function. So paper maps weigh next to nothing. You can put them in any kind of emergency kit or like a go bag or whatever you want. You know, leave them in your car uh, glove compartment. And they'll come in handy since usually in some sort of urgent situation you have to return to somewhere or you have to leave to somewhere and it might even be somewhere that you're not familiar with. For wildfires, I mean, you might just generally hear uh, go northeast. Okay, you never been there before? Cool, grab a map. Fun fact, smoke can sometimes block cell phone tower signals. So the second item is somewhat similar. It's um, digital and or paper printed guides and manuals for anything you own that you might need. Now, while it may be nice to have one for your lawnmower, why would you be concerned with cutting the lawn if an emergency situation is going on? But how to operate that weather radio or how to operate a certain power tool or how to swap out or maintain something, how to change the oil on your generator. We're used to jumping on the internet and just looking it up. Well, if that's not an option, you're going to need to know how to do it because, you know, not everybody can afford to, you know, buy two generators. I wouldn't even recommend it. Most of the time, I don't even recommend one. But if you don't know how to change the fuel filter, you don't know what it means when the red light is blinking for some reason and it won't turn on, you're really going to want that paper printed manual for it or a digital copy on your phone or other mobile device, other computing device. A lot of times you can get these manuals downloaded as a PDF. And by the way, the absolute top of the line Class 10 UHS-1 certified 128 gigabyte storage card for my phone cost a whopping $15. You wouldn't believe how many manuals that would store. So honestly, I would get the digital and the paper versions. I mean, it's not the, you know, eco-friendliest or cheapest thing ever to print off, you know, 100 pages of multiple manuals. But, uh, well, like I said, you're going to want it if the power's out. A lot of people say, yeah, but I've done this three times. I know how to maintain this device or this tool. Try doing it stressed out with uh, one of your family members missing on a lack of food with almost no sleep. And then also maybe half the proper tools you need to do it. You might want that manual. So the next one, everybody heard about paracord, okay? Or some kind of rope. Everybody says, you know, 550 paracord or whatever. That's great, but honestly, some of y'all preppers need to calm down about the paracord, okay? Par paracord is, is, it's lovely, but it is what it is. And speaking of what it is, what it is is heat sensitive and downright flammable. So I know it's not the lightest thing to uh, carry around. I wouldn't even bother putting it in any kind of emergency go big, but I would have it around the house or the garage. Metal wire. If you can afford nickel wire, great. I think it melts at like two or 3,000 degrees, so you're good. It also doesn't uh, oxidize, aka rust. But if you just get some steel wire, some coated stuff, some enamel coated, maybe some aluminum, I guess. I mean, aluminum has a melting temperature well over 1,000 degrees. So if you need to secure something hot, which I mean, working with, you know, fires and improvised cooking, maybe even eh, some electronics or motors, if all you have is rope, you are in trouble. And there's not much in nature that you could do. You can't just take some vines and twist them together. They're even more flammable than paracord. You don't want to start, you know, cutting apart the wires out of your clock radio, which by the way, copper is not a good choice for this either. Just because you need to strap something to your generator dangerously close to the muffler. So the next item is actually candy. I don't know about you, but I remember being a kid, having my uh, Halloween stash, and then finding out that it got down to the stuff I didn't like quite as much, and then sat in the back of a cupboard for four years. It's still usually pretty good. There's pretty high preservatives. I know you might think, sugar, that's attacked by bacteria. Yeah, but that's why they put monstrous amounts of preservatives in most of them. A lot of them, the water evaporates, they get tough, you know, like taffy and uh, Tootsie Rolls and stuff. They just get really, really hard, but they're still pretty good. And in fact, honestly, the less water, the better. 
And if they're sealed in, uh, especially mylar from the factory, you'd be surprised with all the printing on the outside. You might not think that that's mylar, but it is. Uh, if it's clear, it's plastic, though. But either way, I mean, it doesn't exactly let oxygen through. So you don't get a lot of spoilage. I mean, it's not like they start dropping uh, oxygen absorbers or desiccants into a, uh, the packaging, but... It's something, and the other thing is candy is unbelievably cheap, and it has just about the highest um, calorie density you could possibly think of. So I wouldn't exactly start making it, you know, 20% of my food supply just because of, you know, long-term storage issues and the fact that they're completely empty, useless calories with no nutrients whatsoever in them. But, I mean, I just said the magic word, calories. And plus, don't forget about the mental aspect of it. Um, especially in an emergency situation where it's like things are cascading and just one thing after another and your worries are cranked up to 11. You can't contact other people. You're stressed out. I mean, let's say you had a bad day at work and then you had a bad drive home and then uh, got some bad news on your cell phone. You sit down. What's the first thing you feel like doing? Cooking an amazing meal. Or more likely ordering one from a restaurant or stopping at, you know, some place to get a really delicious meal because it's like, that's going to instantly make me happy. Good, tasty food makes you happy, typically. And honestly, nobody doesn't like candy, especially when they're stressed out and hungry. So it might be just the nice little, you know, one to two minute, relax, just take a break from the world, get some tasty calories in you, and then get back at it that you need. Now, the one thing you want to avoid is anything with nuts because they have oil or um, anything with milk products or directly oil in them, like uh, chocolates. You really do just want compressed sugar. But yeah, if you have some uh, questionable candy, you might want to melt it, double boiler, keep it to water temperature, don't burn it. You know, it's it's a whole thing. I could go on about food safety, but uh, just wanted to make sure that you don't forego candy as a small thing you can keep a small amount of. The next item is storage jars of any type, preferably ones with sealing lids. And uh, this is pretty easy. A lot of the stuff you might have noticed you could pick up for dirt cheap. If not free, I mean, digital PDFs from the internet are free and printing stuff is nearly free. But uh, yeah, something with a solid seal. I'm not talking like absolute mason jars and that kind of stuff. Those are nice if you have them. But, uh, you know, maybe jam or jelly jars. That's where I always go. Um, they're glass. Plastic just does not usually hold up. It can crack in the air. It's low grade. Yeah, it's food grade, but it's not exactly plastic meant for outdoor storage. So it's kind of in between on the quality standards for like a peanut butter jar, uh, for example. But uh, yeah, you take a, a, a glass jam jar. I mean, you could keep that in your fridge for six months with the lid on and uh, doesn't tend to evaporate and dry out because the lid is good enough. Now, I say that you might need multiple just small ways to store stuff because it could be anything. But the first things that come to mind are uh, dried seeds and beans. I mean, I just did this today. I dried a bunch of uh, excess beans and cucumber seeds that I had from uh, some that kind of went bad or grew too big. I accidentally let my pickling cucumbers blow up. I thought, okay, let's dry them and, and uh, seal them somewhere moderately airproof. At the very least, out of a risk of condensation. And I thought, well, I'm going to need some glass jars. And I actually didn't have any. I didn't keep any. Um, pill bottles are great for that, too. I mean, they, they can be kind of small, but they're extremely well sealed. So, you know, big uh, thing of Tylenol or whatever. Um, I also just hit up the dollar store. They had just some basic, like, pseudo mason jars where they have, like, uh, kind of a vinyl or silicone seal lid that just kind of pressurizes itself a little bit. It doesn't screw on. It's just glass on glass. And it's not bad, and it was a dollar. So I picked up six of them. And uh, honestly, they really help for just food not going bad if, well, whether you do or don't have refrigeration available. It keeps insects out, it keeps evaporation from happening, drying out. It, you can preserve stuff and let it go quite a while longer. So you don't want to be high and dry, and I would say the cheapest, like, dirtiest, who cares, most compact version of this, since carrying around glass or storing it is not the easiest thing. It's fragile, it's heavy, and it's big. Maybe like a box of 50 basic Ziploc bags. I know those aren't notorious for their amazing, you know, air seal perfection, but they're probably good enough. It's just, you know, a bag versus a rigid glass wall, you're going to limit your uses. And uh, a bag breaks a little bit easier under a slight amount of pressure. So next up, a bicycle. A lot of people think, well, I'm not into cycling. I don't have anywhere to ride. Um, there are no bike lanes around me. Why would I own one of these? In case you got to move and your car doesn't work. Trust me, going on foot is not fun. Uh, through wooded areas, I think, what is it, like eight miles per day if you're really moving, I think is the number. Somewhere in that neighborhood. And that's for a pretty fit person in pretty good shape with no, you know, disabilities or uh, mobility issues. Not saying it's impossible to move 20 miles if you're really booking it and you're a professional hiker and you got light gear, but uh, uh, try one little factor like your f shoes being damaged or your socks being wet and, uh, well, you're going to have a bad time. A, a bicycle, you can move upwards of 20, 25, 30 miles an hour 
while burning, honestly, very little calories. And uh, you can get a decent bicycle on the secondary market for like, I don't know, 30 to 60 bucks in my area, even at pawn shops and stuff. Nicer ones like good mountain bikes upwards of like 150 tops. So it's a bit of investment. It's a bit of a space thing. If you live in like an apartment or a house without uh, a garage, it's like, where do you put it? But it's just one of those considerations. If you think I, I could put it somewhere, I might use it occasionally. And I really, really want to be able to, you know, cruise 20 miles in one hour on a bicycle in case of an emergency to get out of a city or get to, you know, your cousin's house or whatever. Yeah, bicycles are just like tough as nails, very low defect rate items that basically use any human food as fuel because you're the one pedaling. Just make sure you have also like a hand bike pump to uh, pump up the tires because I guarantee if you don't use it very often and it's been sitting, the tires probably aren't in very good condition and even at like 10 PSI, it's almost impossible to ride them. You could move it a spare tire, spare inner tube, spare uh, chains and that kind of stuff, but then it starts to become a whole thing and a big investment when uh, it might be better spent elsewhere like on, you know, long-term storage food. But it's nice to have the option. So next up, we've got scrap paper or uh, to go with it, books and a pen because you can rip out pages of a book and write on them. Maybe. I mean, there's already stuff on that. But I mean, paper can light fires. It's great. I mean, in your area, maybe you have pine needles. Maybe you have some kind of uh, tumbleweed. Maybe you have a lot of like dried hay and straw you have access to and you think, oh, I don't need fire starter here. It all is. But in urban environments, I mean, what are you going to do? Start shaving wood shavings off your furniture and try and light a fire that way? I mean, maybe you have accelerants, gasoline, alcohol, kerosene, hexane, AK, lighter fluid. I don't know. But uh, it, it really is, I mean, with just even a magnifying glass that you can set uh, a lot of paper on fire. The other thing is, you know, books to occupy your mind if you're just sitting around with nothing to do. Now, you probably rarely have nothing to do. You should be looking for food, clean water, whatever. Really depends upon the disaster scenario. So you're either going to tear it up or you're going to use scrap paper to write on and write notes to each other. Leave notes. I mean, it's the original version of texting, basically. I'm in a big note on the back door that says, uh, I went to, and then maybe like a more encoded, encrypted kind of almost a, a mystery or a puzzle or something that only your friends would, uh, understand in case you don't want people following you. Like I went to MM or I went up North and anybody who sees it that knows you would know, Oh, that up North. He only has one property up North. He only knows one friend up North or I went to safe location, you know, something like that. Fun little extra tip for you. But, uh, otherwise, I mean, if, if, Somebody's out looking for food sources, seeing what's going on, trying to figure out, you know, why the power's out, when it's coming back, walking around the city, just getting, you know, intel, trade and stuff. Maybe trying to make a run for some fuel, get some gasoline, whatever, and they get back and then you're out doing something. Well, it would be nice if they knew where you were. So uh, just a simple little notepad is, you know, once again, dollar store fodder right there and just uh, put a couple pens in there, preferably ones that don't freeze. Uh, you might have to research what pen inks don't freeze and... Maybe even dry up over time, that kind of stuff. Might not even be relevant where you live, but just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, you don't want a stack of pens that all don't work. You might even want to throw in a couple mechanical pencils. But uh, yeah, just the written word, making signs, passing information, very, very important, very underestimated by people because people just tend to not use them in their daily life today, so they don't think about them. So the next item, we've got a sewing kit. Um, I know, you know, I'm a single guy. I live alone. I never thought about, let's get into sewing. Uh, I did learn the basics in school, though, and I'm, I'm glad about that. Even if you know nothing about sewing, it's not particularly difficult to figure out and just do at a basic level. So if you're stuck with one pair of pants that you were wearing and you can't get back home or all your clothes were destroyed or stolen by looters or, you know, a fire or the tornado sucked them up and, you know, landed them 10 miles away. Whatever happened if you start being short on clothes or even just really long term in a bad, bad grid down scenario, which is incredibly unlikely. But you never know, and everybody knows that stuff gets holes. What if you have one good, you know, winter jacket, and uh, now you've snagged it on a, you know, a branch or something or a thorn? Uh-oh, <laughs> you know, now it's no longer waterproof. You're going to want to mend that, and uh, holes in your pockets get really annoying. You do not want to drop a screwdriver, a pen, a <laughs> phone charger, a battery pack, food that you put in your pocket. I mean... Being able to repair clothing will be crucial in any kind of ongoing emergency situation. Now, a tornado takes out power in your city for three days. I don't think you'll you know, spend a lot of time sewing or feel the need to unless you're bored. But for long term, it's smart. And uh, I've seen small sewing kits go for, you know, down to like five dollars. So once again, pretty cheap thing to pick up. Next up, plastic sheeting and plastic bags. You know, those things that everybody says is a nuisance and you get them at the grocery store and they're like, oh, I don't want to throw them away, but I don't want to run them back and recycle them. I can't recycle them here in my recycling. Oh, what a nuisance. Well, there is a lot of emergency uses for a material that won't break down for a thousand years. 
a waterproof uh, partial or complete sunlight blocking material. I mean, that's just nice for anything. But uh, plastic sheeting is good for just, you know, you don't want something to get wet. Or, oh, there's now a branch, put a hole in the roof, let's cover the couch. Oh, I'm working on my engine and I'm missing a part, but I don't want to put it all together and I can't close the hood. I know a tarp would be a little bit more useful for that, and, you know, don't forget to buy tarps, that's pretty obvious. I think that's on every uh, emergency survival kit recommendation list. But two or three mil thick uh, painter's plastic, aka plastic sheeting, is rarely on anybody's list. It costs much, much, much less. Uh, you can cut it without getting weird runs in it, and it's lighter, it's just as waterproof, although it's a little bit weaker structurally. But it rolls up, it's light, and it's a nice option to have. And then the next time you want to paint something, or you might get you know, sawdust all over something, you can just throw it down and actually use it. Because uh, items that are useful outside of an emergency situation, but also useful in an emergency situation, should be the first that you target. You never want to plan for the absolute worst and prepare for that and obsess over that, and then not take care of your daily life and have things you really need. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but over the last, oh, we'll say 10 years, 99% of your time has probably been spent living your life normally and not in a crucial, critical emergency survival scenario. It's the 1% you should worry about, but not like, oh, okay, I'm good for everything. And then, oh, I don't have any money left to buy a thing I actually need daily. So, I mean, I could go on and on about plastic sheeting. It's good for containing biohazardous things. You can seal up doors and windows with it. You can uh, do light insulation with it. Technically, you could burn it. I wouldn't go anywhere near it, but it is highly flammable. You could use it as a really crappy improvised sale. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. So I'd pick up a roll or two. I mean, they do have it at the dollar store, but it's only usually under five for some pretty good stuff, like a 20 by 10 of uh, two or three mil at the hardware store in 2020 in US dollars in America. Now, the next item, I kind of hinted at this, but... um. It's something to do, something to occupy your mind, because uh, a lot of survival scenarios are uh, filled with a lot of boredom. You can't do your normal things like jump on the internet, watch a movie, watch some Netflix, listen to music. I mean, maybe you could if you got a good enough solar charger and a battery bank for your phone, but uh, a nice book to read or a, a phone with a really cheap memory card full of, uh, you know, ripped movies from your own DVD collection or whatever, however you want to do it. Maybe some downloaded eBooks, maybe some uh, printed physical books. Uh, board games, I mean, if you, you know, you've got a family and in a disaster scenario, they're going to be bored, especially your kids I'm referring to. Or maybe, you know, you're all mentally set, but your uh, significant other isn't, or your uh, roommate is more the type to freak out and stress and uh, get in a bit of an unsafe mood over everything. Well, you're going to need distraction to take their mind off it, because just sitting there with nothing to do, no electricity, and a bunch of problems that you can't do anything about immediately, not good. Just just you trapped there with your thoughts and nothing to do. That's, that's not great. So something long-term entertaining and uh, mentally stimulating would be very, very, very crucial in a lot of scenarios. Now, a lot of people have in their mind, because they've watched television... Okay, disaster survival scenario... I am out in the woods 50 miles away from anybody. Now, why? Why are you out in the woods 50 miles away from anybody? I'm not saying it wouldn't happen. I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I mean, sure, zombie outbreak. Maybe. I kind of doubt it, but maybe. So you're far away from civilization because the Martians invaded. I don't know what people are thinking. They need to stop getting their uh, scenarios from Hollywood, though. And survivalist shows, but they're like, okay, every single second needs to be like gathering firewood, building a shelter. There's never enough time in the day. We're burning daylight nonstop. There's no time to sit around and read a dang book on my phone. I need to be hunting and fishing and checking my snares and rabbits and this and that. I mean, yeah, okay, if if you're, I mean, if, if the disaster scenario is literally you are lost in the woods, why'd you bring a bunch of books anyway? But if you're just like, oh, the power's out, the internet's out, I got nothing to do, and, uh, just patched up a window that a tree just went through and chopped it up with my uh, nice little handsaw. Well, now what? And maybe it fell on your uh, car, too, and you don't feel like going on a bike ride because honestly, that wouldn't even be safe. Or there's power lines down everywhere, so even if you wanted to go somewhere, you shouldn't. Or you want to keep an eye because somebody could crawl through your front window and the tarp that you duct taped up. So you're just sitting home, and there there is nothing productive for you to do. You've run out of things to do, and there's a lot of hours in the day, and obviously you're not going into work. That type of scenario is so much more common. I mean, anything from tornadoes to like full-blown area, you know, Hurricane Katrina kind of stuff where, yeah, you might want to scavenge, you might want to group up, you might want to try and get to somewhere where you can communicate a radio, working, whatever. Maybe find out if somebody's passing out rations and tents and, you know, somebody has a boat or whatever. 
But if you ask anybody, I mean, the, the dramatic stories get on the news, but a lot of people will say there was just sitting around doing nothing. It's like, yeah, our house wasn't flooded. It's just oh, no power, nothing. They're not going to have power back for a month or two. No power, no radio, no batteries, don't know where to go. It's like, well, you could just walk around blindly in a very hazardous scenario when you don't know what anybody else is up to. You can't call the police. That's a whole other thing. Or you can sit home and wait for orders, wait to see what happens, wait for the storm to pass until you try and make a decision. A lot of waiting involved in a lot of emergency situations, especially weather events. Or in some kind of, you know, Syria type of scenario where it's like a government overthrow, civil war, you know, military action battle thing. Uh, there's staying home, doing nothing while bored, while also hiding at home. So, I mean, I just want to throw out all these different scenarios. A lot of people go to the, the craziest stuff, the stuff they've seen on TV and the most sensationalized stories and think, why would I possibly bring a book into these scenarios? Well, you might just need a book and a you know, copy of Monopoly or something. Just saying. The next item, and boy, do people overlook this. It is salt. Just simple table salt. You might be thinking, salt, I have enough salt in my diet. Thank you. My, my doctor told me to reduce it. Great, but you also needed to live. You know the phrase, worth their salt? That comes from way back in ancient Rome, I believe, where uh, they would literally pay soldiers in salt instead of currency in some cases. Because salt just, it, it didn't have the modern infrastructure. It, it was close. I mean, they shipped stuff. I mean, the, the trade routes and the whole, the Silk Road and all this stuff all through time. People traded stuff. Even spices made their way from, you know, thousands of miles. But now it's just, oh, some big machinery and it goes to some mine somewhere out and who knows where it gets a bunch of salt, sends it to all the grocery stores and people need like not even a gram of it per day. But the thing is, people need it. Without salt, you will 100% absolutely die, and in all likelihood, since you've never been short on salt in your entire life, you won't know what's happening or how to fix it. Also, plain table salt is usually uh, iodized. It has iodine in it. You need iodine for proper thyroid function, especially if you are a developing child, but even adults need it as your cells regenerate and rebuild and that kind of stuff. And uh, the last thing you want in a uh, disaster scenario survival environment is a thyroid problem because that handles energy distribution, uh, even I think temperature regulation, just basically your whole metabolism, aka energy level and sleepiness. Oh, and uh, by the way, you need salt because your nervous system, all the nerves in your brain are made out of uh, potassium and sodium, among other things. They uh, carry the electrical impulses because they're conductive. So without salt, your nervous system shuts down. So like a small coffee can size of salt is like a dollar or less at most places. And uh, the only concern with keeping it on the shelf is uh, clumping up because it doesn't tend to have an anti-clumping agent. And I think even if it does, like that's a problem. And I think non-iodized salt, so salt with no iodine in it, clumps less, I think. You know, honestly, if my salt clumps up, I'm not just going to roll over and die. I'm going to get out a hammer, but... Uh, it certainly doesn't go bad, but you wouldn't want things mixing with it. It's obviously, by definition, not a very reactive compound, unlike trying to store baking soda. Like lemon juice or alcohol, I mean, anything will break those down. But, uh, you know, salt can do some things. I mean, sodium and chlorine are somewhat reactive. So you might want to bare minimum put it in like a sealed glass instead of maybe like the paper, thin, cardboardy type of material it comes in. There's certainly no need to throw an oxygen absorber in it. Um, you could do a desiccant if you really wanted. That absorbs water. You don't want water in your salt. But uh, personally, I buy about 50% non-iodized and 50% iodized. Just to cover my bases and because uh, you really don't need that much iodine. You need some, but you don't need like a lot of it. So salt's actual uses, besides making, you know, a lot of food taste better, I mean, you could take some, uh, you know, squirrel, you caught, or a rabbit or something and try and eat the meat and it'll be really plain. It'll taste better if you're hungry. That's great. But, uh... You probably don't have a lot of sauces or anything, so just plain table salt is the most universal seasoning you could possibly imagine. And it keeps better than any dried leaf herb like oregano. Also, you could use it to preserve food. It's not the easiest thing to do. It might be used in addition to, like, smoking or, you know, jerky, that kind of stuff. But uh, it has a use there as well, as far as food preservation. So next up, some sort or multiple sorts, preferably, of fire suppression. Because remember, in a disaster scenario, like especially a weather event, you've got all kinds of power lines down. You've got stuff coming back on and off. You've got power surges that could easily, you know, light a very cheap Chinese, poorly made, unsafe electronic on fire. You might be doing all kinds of improvised wiring and stuff. You're just so much more likely to have a fire, not to mention, you know, candles and trying to cook on a fire, which I wouldn't recommend indoors, but people have been that stupid in uh, disaster scenarios. And uh, let me just remind you, if the cell phone network's down and the electricity's down and your phones are offline, uh, you can't call the fire department. And even if you could, they're probably not coming. Maybe the roads aren't clear. Maybe they're being blocked by uh, peaceful protesters. 
Now, you've probably heard, oh, the cops aren't coming, you're on your own, so have pepper spray and maybe a, you know, a pistol or something for defense just in case. But um, also, the fire department ain't coming. So, you know, oh, I got pepper spray in my pocket. Cool. Basic self-defense. I have basic hand-to-hand combat. Well, what basic things do you have to stop a house fire or like, you know, a car fire, or anything, a forest fire, your lawn's on fire, your tree's on fire. So, um, chemical suppressant, uh, and like oil fire grade, uh, fire extinguishers, not a good idea. They're also way more expensive, but, um, you need like professional, careful, cautious stuff to clean up the, uh, residue. It's toxic. I don't know exactly what it is. But I know that compressed CO2 works a hell of a lot better as far as like safety and not turning your front lawn into a chemical war zone. CO2, it's compressed. It comes out extremely cold. So it steals energy from the fire and then no oxygen, no fire. Fire is literally just oxidizing fuel. That's what it is. Uh, CO2 is somewhat effective against uh, certain like electrical style fires too. And it'll stop really anything other than non-oxidizing. Now, the other thing is, um, you know a pressurized rain rain barrel. Like if you have one single 55 gallon rain barrel that uh, has like a little bypass spout going to your uh, downspouts usually. So your whole roof collects water for it. It's usually how they work. A lot of people use it for gardening just to not use chlorinated water because it does bad things to the microbes in the soil. But uh, yeah, 55 gallons is over 400 pounds pushing down and there's a spout on the bottom and usually you can put a hose to it. So also, you know, 55 gallons of water is quite a lot. You could put out quite a lot of fires with that. Probably not like a whole house, but you know, maybe slow it down. It would mitigate it. You could uh, stop something early. The big thing is capacity and speed. How quick can you get it out and ready? If you got to sit there and oh, unscrew the cap, do this, hook a hose up, do, get a sprayer, check the pressure. Yeah, whatever's on fire is a lot more on fire now. Um, if you just have a, a simple fire extinguisher, you pull it out, spray it, ta-da. I mean, that's how people stop a lot of kitchen fires. And if you think that kitchen and cooking related fires, even with the electricity on, is not going to be more of a problem in some sort of uh, improvisational semi-emergency scenario... Uh, with the whole COVID-19 lockdowns, the initial like really hard lockdowns where almost everybody was home in America, people who would always eat out and rely on fast food were like, well, I guess I'll try and cook these things. I got some noodles. I got some whatever. I'm no cooking expert, but uh, maybe done it once or twice before. Let's do it. During the initial COVID lockdowns, the number of cooking related burns that resulted in an emergency room visit absolutely skyrocketed. Just remember, dumb modern people in at least 2020 when I'm recording this they're bad at quite a lot of things that take a lot of things for granted and they have a lot less skills than we did a hundred years ago. I'm not one of those, oh, things were so much better a hundred years ago, people, because that's not true. But just remember, I mean, I always give the Pokemon Go example. When Pokemon Go came out and everybody decided to leave their house and go walk around places, apparently just that sentence I just said is inherently dangerous to people who aren't used to doing that. People got lost. People accidentally trespassed. People got attacked by animals. People got robbed. People fell in lakes. So then you got COVID where it's like people tried to cook. Look how that worked out. Now try cooking with like the power down, some kind of improvised thing, or you got something running off a generator or whatever. And it's, oh gosh, it's really, really like homemade rigged up ghetto electrical systems. Last time a tornado hit where I used to work, we hooked up generators to all the servers, terminals, everything. We had three or four generators running and uh, just cords running everywhere through puddles and this and that. We had shorts. We had stuff almost light on fire. We had the wrong gauge and people putting strips into strips, popping uh, fuses, people spilling gasoline on the, the generators, lighting them on fire. People are dumb. Stuff's going to light on fire. You really need some fire suppression. Trust me. Do not overlook that. So the next item on the list, I believe we're on number like 14 or two, depending upon how you want to do it, but they're not ranked anyway, except for the last one last one absolutely is number one but this one is uh dental care items uh, i do occasionally hear this mentioned and recommended by some people but other people are like well that that's a cosmetic thing what am i gonna have you know some uh you know mouthwash just so my breath smells fresh as a tornado ripped through my city am i gonna want to have uh really bright white minty teeth and perfect breath for the zombie apocalypse yes actually because the dentist is closed now, this is more of a very, very long-term thing, I will say that, because usually, what, you go to the dentist every six months, they tell you if you have a cavity or you two, clean your teeth, get rid of the built-up plaque, and you're good. So, uh, honestly, the person with the average nice, good, healthy teeth right now, it would take quite a long time, something on the years scale, for them to fall apart. Now, that said, I have heard stories of people who, because of, you know, mental disorders or some kind of injury or severe depression, have gone without brushing their teeth suddenly for about 40 or 50 days, and they had infections in their gums, abscesses, they had toothaches, they had immense, you know, rot and all this. And it's because you just weren't used to living like that. Your immune system wasn't ready for it just to, for cleaning to just stop. Modern humans cannot tolerate that. And even back in the day, I mean, 
what was the solution? It, it would be a miracle if you still had all your teeth by the time you were like 50 in the 1700s, 1800s, maybe even early 1900s. And, uh, oh, just go get some Novocaine and a nice, you know, nitrous ox. Oh, wait, no, there's none of that. The infrastructure collapsed. Oh, guess how they're pulling that tooth out? You'll be lucky if there's even alcohol to get a little tipsy before that uh, operation. And I use that term lightly. You would just suck it up, get wrecked on whatever you had and sniff some ether or whatever the heck they did back in the day and then rip the tooth out with some pliers. Or like tie a string to it and, I don't know, slap a horse and tie it to the horse. I don't know what they did. It wasn't pretty and your other option is massive infection and a horrible ongoing toothache to the point where you can't even sleep, okay? Dental care is basically considered medical care at this point and the lack of medical care is going to be the most nightmare scenario in a, an extended grid down SHTF style thing, which as I said, compared to a weather event, a temporary thing, you know, a weekend protest in your area, you know, a flood, a localized issue, maybe your local power plant exploded. That's more common and more likely than, oh, look, all of society collapsed and it's been three months or six months or two years or four years. So, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily make dental care the number one thing, but if you're going to be in a bad scenario for maybe like two weeks because of something, or maybe a month, like, you know, Hurricane Katrina, where, you know, y'all get together in the FEMA camps and, uh, well, now what? You could be approaching that, you know, 30, 40, 50 day mark where I've heard of people getting really, really severe dental problems because they just can't brush. There is no toothpaste around. So just basic toothpaste or a good cheap replacement is baking soda, which obviously also has other uses and it's pretty easy to store and seal. But uh, really the big one is floss because a lot of cavities uh, occur between the teeth and a lot of gum disease starts from between the teeth. Uh, brushing and toothpaste are really just, you know, obviously fluoride and then they help with um, removing biofilm from the stuff you ate in the day that can turn into plaque, that can make bacteria hide in it, that can result in acidic compounds made by the bacteria that can eat away at your enamel. It's a very long-term slow thing, but... The food basically rotting with bacteria on it right between your teeth, that bypasses everything and goes straight to cavity and problems and infections. So dental floss, number one thing, and then you could just go from there. And the number one thing, I have literally never seen this item on a recommended list or video or guide anywhere ever, and it pisses me off. Especially because this affects me extremely because I have dark blue eyes, and just because of my genetics and where my ancestors grew up, I guess, a just hypersensitivity to ultraviolet light. I literally cannot go outside in the summer, period, without sunglasses. I can't, I can't, I wouldn't be able to see. I tried going to the mailbox one time when I couldn't find my sunglasses, and by the time I got back in, my eyes were fried. I was barely seeing. It, it was terrible. And it was, you know, 100 degree day, very high UV. And people with slightly different genetics, different retina colors, different this, that, tolerances, where you grew up, whatever, who knows, it's practically random at this point. You might be able to get away with no sunglasses, but for someone like me, I, I would be so unable to do anything outside without sunglasses i have probably 10 pairs sitting around in different areas and i've got two or three pairs in my emergency bag because i am just instantly absolutely blind and done without them so i mean i don't care about durability style i don't care what brand name it is i care about being able to see outdoors so i went to the dollar store and picked up a whole bunch of thin frame large ones for a dollar now maybe you could go a little higher, go to some $14.99 gas station models, maybe even polarized lenses, get up in the 20s. But, I mean, I'd recommend picking them up in bulk. They're very hard to store. They don't like weight on top of them. They crack and break easily. And uh, very, very close to indestructible glasses are very expensive and typically, um, you know, prescription only, really. I'm sure you can get them with flat lenses. The last time I checked, they're like three, dollars $400. And even then, you could still scratch the lenses, just saying, you know, so, you know, what do you want? Like 40 of them for a dollar each or one nice set for $500? I'm you know, just saying. I got pairs in my car. I've got them in my glove compartment. I got them in my center console. I've got them in my go bag. I've got them in my camping kits. I've got them in my emergency supplies in my basement. I have got sunglasses everywhere because they are just so stupidly critical. And you think, well, if I don't have this, if I don't have a battery and an inverter, I don't have that. I don't have a car. I don't have fuel. I don't have a bike. I could maybe get around it. I could do this. I could do that. I could, I could cascade into this. I could build it myself. I could cook outside. I could start a fire. What could you possibly do to create your own sunglasses? I have some theoretical ideas that involve certain types of thin spray paints that people use to like kind of partially smoke shadow their uh, taillights on their car. Even done perfectly, it still looks pretty ricer. Don't do that. But maybe you could do that with some kind of, I don't know, clear plastic steal a plastic window out of some junk mail. I, I don't know. 
it would be such a pain to try to improvise that and make it work and make something you can still see through, but that blocks a su sufficient amount of sunlight. It's a virtually irreplaceable item. You just simply can't improvise it. So I would strongly recommend people just go get bulk glasses somewhere or just raid the dollar store. And like I said, it drives me nuts that nobody ever mentioned sunglasses for uh, things to have around in case of an emergency scenario. Maybe it's just me and my hypersensitive vision, but uh, I've heard it's mostly a blue-eyed thing, especially a dark blue-eyed thing. But uh, if it even affects one person other than me, you know I'm putting it at number one in this list. Because in a disaster scenario, basically being blind would be pretty bad. So that is my top 15, though still not ranked in any order. Uh, most overlooked items for emergency kits, emergency survival, long-term, short-term, tried to mix it up a little bit. I bet somewhere in this video you're already on Amazon or eBay or uh, making a shopping list to go pick it up locally for some of the items I just mentioned because nobody likes having blind spots and I think I kind of sensationalized the absolute disaster scenarios. But, well, I mean, is it though? I mean, uh, you know, being unsafe is being unsafe. It's all a numbers thing and, you know, you don't want something going bad on top of a scenario already going bad. So be prepared. Speaking of that, hey, you're a little bit smarter and safer for watching this video. So why don't you, uh, you know, maybe favorite it if you want to reference it uh, in the future. And uh, if you want to help out just humanity as a whole, uh, post this video on social media and tell your friends, hey, you need to see this. Especially challenge your uh, more, you know, disaster safety uh, oriented or like even prepper type of friends. Challenge them to watch this and see how many items they weren't aware of. And then laugh at them. Just kidding. D don't be a jerk. And most importantly, don't forget to hit the subscribe button because I'm going to have a ton of content coming out on this channel. And it is going to be the most well-researched, well-presented, well-edited, well-shot, best examples, gear reviews, everything you could possibly want to know about surviving disastrous situations. Oh, and as is the policy, no politics, no obsession with exact specific scenarios, no social commentary, and just nothing but useful information. So thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you guys next video.